Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. It's been a great conference so far. I hope you've enjoyed it and made a lot of good connections. We have um, this track is the plenary session for the Behavioral Health Summit, both in person and online. So we're going to be um, joining us are, are our several people on many people online. The list is growing. That's great. And of course, Dr. Chan um, from California. And I'm going to kind of introduce the topic and introduce Dr. Chan. Uh, so I uh, I work myself in this digital innovation space. I, I like to invent things. It's a sickness. Um, I don't know if there's a diagnosis for it, but it's it's definitely a thing. Um, but I I look around at people that are doing this. And some people are there's a lot of venture capital money in this space. There are um, new things in technology that that have some concerning aspects to it, and some that just kind of blow you away and um, it's really exciting. Last year we did one on um, AI and behavioral health and how AI is getting into everything. I know Dr. Chan will probably mention that as well. Um, but there's a lot of problems to be solved, and we need to be addressing how do we use technology in in behavioral health care. Behavioral health care has not been, um, not seen a lot of uh, paradigm changes, right, in the last 50 years. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one individual and, and group clinical work, um, but we have now a, a huge array of uh, digital tools um, that we can make HIPAA compliant and make integrated with our workflows or use them as our automated workflows. And uh, some people are worried that technology will replace therapists. And um, as I said yesterday, we will, we will never ever have enough clinicians in the world ever. Um, the population growth is so much faster than our graduate growth. Um, so the problem that we have now is only compounding many, many more times. So we really have to find innovative ways of, of attacking these challenges. So that's in primary care and in just direct behavioral health care across the spectrum from different ages with the tools that we already have. So today with us, we have um, Dr. Stephen Chan, um, and he is a clinical informaticist and psychiatrist and clinical assistant professor at Stanford University School of Medicine. He does uh, a few other top secret things that we can't talk about on the show today, um, but uh, he's, he's an amazing man and working in a lot of amazing spaces. So Dr. Chan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Jay, thank you so much for the introduction. I wanna thank you and Kathy Wiverly and the rest of the team at the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center for having me. Uh, I am excited to be speaking about this topic uh, growing up as someone who uh, grew up with the Apple IIe and the Mac and pa and then paper records and and uh, uh, and now digital records, it's it's exciting to see a lot of the digital transformation that's taking place. So today we're going to be talking about not just the present and kind of contextualize the uh, current status of mental health, but also some of the things that are happening on the horizon, some of the things that are already happening now but also what it will take to get to the next level. We're gonna hear from other speakers later today, Christy Vo, one of my colleagues from Vita Health, as well as uh, Ed Kafterian from Orbit Health uh, about some of their the work that they're doing. Um, for me, myself, I've uh, had the privilege of working at Stanford University's uh, School of Medicine uh, at, a, at an affiliated health site, as well as the American Psychiatric Association on a lot of these topics. So we're gonna get right into it. I have some disclosures here. Um, I have um, interests in async health, orbit health, telepsychiatry, advanced clinical, UCSF, UC Davis, as well as Stanford University. And I also teach at uh, Psych Congress, HMP Global. So let's talk about mental health today. We all know that mental health is such an important topic, but even before COVID-19 hit, one in five adults worldwide suffered from a mental health condition in any sort of given year, uh, according to the World Health Organization. And mental health has really big effects on not just physical health, but also uh, as well as their mortality. It's estimated that on average, people with serious mental illness die 25 years earlier than the general population and unaddressed mental illness also impacts overall healthcare costs so amongst medicaid beneficiaries with chronic conditions 
healthcare costs can be up to 75% higher if they have a mental illness. We see this play out in Medicaid, Medi-Cal, where I'm at, a variation of Medicaid in California, as well as Medicare, where they're es essentially having much higher healthcare spend uh, and up to eight uh, five times as much. So it's a, a very, very uh, large issue um, that we're facing. We also see this as a number one cause of disability in the world. There are risk factors that contribute to depression, for instance, allergy, obesity, poor sleep hygiene, poor diet, smoking, stress. All of these can really cause people to have low energy, low mood, the low motivation. Um, and that's why we're seeing a lot of apps, a lot of platforms address these risk factors. Um, and we're also seeing, as Jay Ostrowski uh, you know, mentioned earlier, there's a mental health care professional shortage in the United States. Look at all the blue here. Uh, the blue indicates wide swaths of counties without um, with a shortage of mental health care professionals. And there are many counties that don't have psychiatrists. Um, we see this play out throughout the rest of the world as well, uh, where we see uh, these lighter colored areas uh, as areas that need uh, more mental health support, uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, and nurses and social workers. Um, we also see that even if we do have access to mental health, financially, it can be a burden. Uh, people can't afford mental health. This is that's the top reason. That's the top uh, reason in this row here. Um, according to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, a lot of uh, folks, fewer than half of them, receive treatment and, and costs are an issue. Also, there's been some um, misconceptions about how they can handle these problems. So we see this uh, again as an economic burden in the workplace. We are seeing more employee assistant prof uh, uh, assistance programs that address things like absenteeism uh, and presenteeism, where you have reduced productivity while you're at work. Um, and we're also seeing a lot of uh, direct medical costs because of major depressive disorder, <laughs> typo there, uh, and then a portion of total expenditures related to suicide. So we often think of mental health as, you know, th there's a common saying, you know, the mental health system is broken. The mental health system isn't working. I think that <clears throat> the current way that things are set up is a patchwork of things, but it's very similar to how, you know, physical health, there is a, there can be a, this feeling that there's a patchwork of uh, departments and a patchwork of specialties uh, trying to work together. Canada has this model of a mental health continuum. So if you're trying to figure out where things lie with your telehealth technologies or where you're say deploying your next startup uh, platform, um, you can potentially place your technologies on the spectrum. Healthy uh, individuals who need some maintenance, people who have trouble sleeping or have procrastination or headaches, people who are injured and people who are uh, needing much more wraparound support with excessive amounts of symptoms that cause them to be disabled in other ways. We are also seeing these different levels of psychiatric services um, where you have natural supports, your family, potentially spiritual supports as well. Primary care as well is the bedrock. Uh, primary care often sees uh, some of the most com uh, complex uh, mental health conditions if they're the sole provider around. We have basic psychiatric services and psychological services, uh, such as specialty medication management. We also see peer support services and then enhanced wraparound case management services, um, and then residential services and crisis services as handling the most intense and extreme sort of cases.
So how do we diagnose all of these uh, mental health issues? Well, if you remember from childhood, the Choose Your Own Adventure book, uh, it's not quite like that, but it's much more complex. There is a very, very thick manual of interview, uh, interview processes called the SCID, uh, Structured Clinical Interview for Diagnosis. This questionnaire here is one of the most common questionnaires, the patient health questionnaire, aptly named uh, more because it's actually covering uh, depression. But the, this particular questionnaire doesn't cover it all. It's just a very, very simple questionnaire. Um, we have the DSM-5 manual. The DSM is, you know, uh, known as, say, the Bible or the manual or the Quran, a manual of uh, mental disorders. Uh, and the APA has also released online assessment measures uh, to help with diagnoses and, uh, and research as well. There are a lot of different uh, self-help uh, books out there. Uh, these are some resources that people use to uh, essentially help uh, learn about their condition, much like any sort of other uh, disease-oriented book or uh, wellness-oriented book. This is probably the most uh, uh, famous one on CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. You also have self-help apps, audiobooks and guides, talk therapy. Um, there are lots of worksheets by mental health organizations, advocacy organizations, a lot of resources out there, such as the DBSA, NAMI, Mental Health America, mentalhealth.gov, and the American Psychiatric Association itself, uh, all with uh, patient support services. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different providers, psychologists, social workers, marriage and family therapists, and physicians. So the good news is that you have all of these uh, folks to help uh, if you are able to access them. Um, the, all of them have their own superpowers. Um, at the same time, it's a, it is a complex system. And uh, much like physical health has different specialties and different levels of therapists, um, so too does mental health. And COVID-19 has really changed things uh, quite a bit with mental health. We're seeing this with all, all providers, not just psychiatrists, who are using um, telehealth more. Um, in this one is a paper that was released about the largest community health system in the nation, New York City Health and Hospitals, where they found that essentially people can complete their visits much more, even uh, uh, versus uh, prior to COVID-19 in-person visits. So there's a lot that we should advocate for and continue with telehealth. There's a lot of hope for the future. Um, there's a lot less stigma. A lot of people are talking about it, even the, in the popular press, BuzzFeed, um, podcasts. Uh, there are even podcasts for specific uh, conditions that you might be facing, such as uh, this one for insomnia, sleep. Uh, issues. Uh, social media, we're seeing a lot of varieties of information. This particular one, at least, is a, an example of good information and patient advocacy from Mental Health America. And we're also seeing examples of peer support. So this isn't exactly like telehealth technology, but just think of this. This is one way of reaching a wider audience, which is why we're seeing health systems and professional organizations invest in patient education and clinical education materials through these ubiquitous platforms. Uh, one of my mentors uh, and uh, colleagues was the former president of the American Telemedicine Association. And, and, uh, and I know we've talked about the shortage earlier. We've talked about how there uh, is a need for additional mental health support. Um, but there's different ways we can deliver care, uh, mental health care. This particular one's called asynchronous. Asynchronous meaning it's not at the same time. Uh, this for telepsychiatry. Um, and he's been studying this, uh, he and his team and our team have been studying this for um, over a decade, where we're finding that it's diagnostically reliable. It's not for therapy, not for delivering talk therapy, but it can be used for monitoring treatment progress and it's easier to manage. 
And so uh, this particular model of care can help improve communication between patients and providers. So here's how it works. There I am as a patient uh, and one of our, our former research uh, associates, who's the interviewer, um, where the video is routed to a psychiatrist for diagnosis and treatment notes, potential future uses for video and data analysis. Um, step one of three, we collect this data, basically the video. Step two, we look at the video, we review it, we write a note, we chart it, we send it off to the doctor or the primary care provider. And then the primary care provider can then take care of the referrals, can then take care of the medications and provide that care until the next asynchronous video uh, evaluation. So this is it in a nutshell, stuff in the gray on the left, the gray uh, is what we're used to, Zoom, um, VA Video Connect. All of these are synchronous, same time, synchronous modes. Asynchronous splits up the tasks, but it also makes it uh, easier on the psychiatrist, who is uh, essentially, uh, there's fewer short shortage, uh, fewer psychiatrists uh, in the nation and in the world who can provide uh, treats, uh, specialty treatment recommendations. So that's asynchronous telepsychiatry in a nutshell. Something we're also seeing too is something called natural language processing, NLP, where you look at natural language. Look at these messages here on the left the, from patients. Um, there's a, a red message and a green message here. And this red message says, I think my depression and irritation is getting worse. The green message here says, things are going well, my sleep is great, blah, blah, blah. And you can actually plug these in to uh, Google Cloud. Uh, they have a NLP engine where it spits out a report card. And this report card can see that there's a lot more greens uh, in the uh, message below, um, the message on the bottom. And potentially you can have a computer decide on uh, whether to triage this as a high priority or triage this as a normal, let's say normal priority. Um, and, a, and, and so you can then help with queue management and message management, a very common source of burnout. Right now, I know that folks uh, use this with uh, medical assistants to help uh, take an inbound calls, and then they take on the um, higher level, uh, they escalated to uh, the physician or the specialty provider um, for uh, uh, continued processing if needed. You also are seeing um, the commoditization, the commoditization of um, platforms. Um, Azure, Microsoft Azure had released this platform um, where it can take any sort of image and uh, report on their emotion and a guesstimate as to their age. Um, and so potentially you could find uses for this in the mental health realm. People are using this uh, sort of, these sort of machine learning and AI um, sort of algorithms to see if they can use this for mental health. Um, because often, you know, what we do as psychiatrists is look at emotion and we listen to people and figure out if there's some sort of, um, some sort of new pattern that could potentially lead to a diagnosis. Um, we've seen this play out with um, the University of Southern California, USC. They have an Institute for Creative Technologies where they're looking at facial recognition and avatars, virtual reality avatars. And, uh, and they're using these for to deliver sort of education and uh, virtual therapies. Um, Virt uh, the Veterans Affairs, probably, I would say, it, probably the largest health system in the United States with over 130 medical centers and thousands of clinics around the nation and the Pacific Ocean and other military bases. Uh, the VA has their own app store. Um, colleagues there have released things that address specific conditions, smoking, PTSD, um, weight, weight uh, loss. Uh, they've even released this uh, to the public too. You can find them, VA Mobile Health Practice Guide. Um, and this potentially could be a source for 
uh, education materials if you have your own providers. This one is particularly veteran centric, uh, but this could be used as a model for how to teach um, how to teach uh, um, your clinicians how to use uh, the apps. Stanford University and VA colleagues uh, from the Stanford Tech Hub, which I'm a part of, uh, just released this uh, pause a moment, PAM, P-A-M, pause a moment, um, for uh, psychological support. Uh, Shannon Sturman, uh, one of uh, the attending psychologists and professors, released this with her lab. And then COVID Coach on the right from the National Center for PTSD on managing stress and mood checking um, so these are all valuable resources. These are all free to download and potentially disseminate uh, to uh, your uh, patients and to your own health system. Um, there are so many different platforms out there. I think that one of the challenges, and we're talk, we'll talk about this a bit more later, is uh, how do you uh, evaluate or choose amongst these all? Well, the good news is that a lot of these are low cost. You can try it out yourself. and uh, and it's a low risk. So it's not something that's going to be uh, an imminent danger to someone. But there have been some papers that talk about some apps that are more amateur hour apps uh, that talk about things like, well, you should drink alcohol to relax and go to sleep, things like that. You don't want to recommend drinking alcohol <laughs> um, uh, necessarily. And I don't think that that's uh, something we do uh, in clinical practice. Um, and we'll talk about how to evaluate these technologies uh, later on in this talk. But chat-driven apps like Youper um, and CBT apps like Sunvelo, you can download these essentially uh, for very low to no cost. Now, what about high quality, high, um, uh, high evidence uh, apps? Uh, one of the main complaints in the past has been well, the app stores like the Wild West. There's so many different apps out there. And there, uh, there can be, but there, we're seeing the professionalization uh, of these apps into something called PDTs, Prescription Digital Therapeutics, PDTs. These also go by the name DTX for digital therapies or digital uh, treatments, as well as uh, SAMD, S-A-M-D, SAMD is something used more by the uh, by the FDA, uh, and that stands for Software as a Medical Device, SAMD, SAMD. But this particular one, I don't endorse uh, necessarily any of these products, um, but Pair Therapeutics is one of uh, the most well-known where they've developed essentially a, a mood tracking and medication adherence and coaching uh, app, a virtual coaching app uh, to be used in conjunction with standard treatment. Now, just think, a provider can go ahead and prescribe these, uh, potentially, if the systems are set up. Um, reset O for opiate use disorder. But we'll talk about some of the issues with these. Uh, for instance, one of them is, well, we have pharmacies for medications, and we have so many different pharmacies across the nation to help with, uh, with giving pills and treatments, medication treatments. Why don't we have something like that for um, the digital space? Um, I know that we some, we, some health systems do have um, concierge or support services, but uh, it's not ubiquitous, right? Thrive, uh, some of these apps, one of the issues we've talked about with apps is that sometimes they can be discontinued. They can just disappear from the app store. This is not something uh, I don't think I don't know if it necessarily showed up on the App Store, but this one is no longer marketed. Um, Thrive for schizophrenia. Um, we're also seeing this trend over the past few years for something that the New York Times bills as restaurant menu medicine, and uh, it's essentially where uh, these are direct to consumer brands that uh, are delivering questionnaires and interviews and then are reviewed by physicians or nurse practitioners or physician assistants. And then they uh, potentially potentially are prescribed by uh, with medications. And we're seeing this for depression, anxiety, along with lots of other conditions that are fairly, um, fairly common in primary care. 
urinary tract infections. And you notice that, gosh, these interfaces are so beautiful. <laughs> the interface looks, uh, you know, gorgeous and you can, and so this is something that uh, I think is helping us make uh, healthcare more accessible by reducing the amount of jargon and increasing uh, the friendliness and approachability of some of these previously stigmatized uh, bad medications, certainly like depression. Even Google has gotten into this. Uh, if you, uh, this was, these are screenshots from five years ago that I took of Google Assistant. Um, and at the time, they would just kind of scour, curate, and present specific answers to you from the web. But now, like, so for instance, I, you know, five years ago, I wrote, I, I asked Google, I feel very anxious. And it gave some uh, okay answers. Now it actually provides empathic feedback. This is Google. This is not a specific mental health app. This is straight up Google Assistant you can download. And it actually has these apps on the bottom where, you know, if I'm asking it to relieve stress, you know, actually give potential solutions from its own app catalog. You know, this is part of the voice user interface phenomenon. It's closely tied into chatbots. These are all conversational agents. Um, and Google has been great at uh, incorporating screeners from, uh, I believe it's Mental Health America, as well as content from other organizations. And we're seeing this similar playbook take, uh, take effect. Some of my colleagues from Stanford Brainstorm Stanford Brainstorm is a lab that uh, consults with uh, organizations. And the psychiatrist uh, founders at Stanford Brainstorm consulted with um, Pinterest. And this is because Pinterest, they were finding that people were entering words for depression and anxiety. Um, and, and they were finding uh, glum pictures. So instead of glum pictures and glum search results, why not find something to tackle that uh, glum mood? Right. Facebook itself has built in suicide flags and ways uh, that are designed to uh, bring support, uh, even anonymously. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see how sophisticated all of these user interfaces have become. Um, and, you know, I know that health systems uh, are have been adopting uh, chatbots, too. Um, if you look at the veterans affairs, I'm not speaking for them necessarily, uh, but they had a, a, a Kaylee Yuen, a presidential innovation fellow who put together a chatbot to help with COVID triage. Uh, and that really reduced the amount of uh, redundant phone calls. What if we went beyond the app store? We're seeing specialty app stores certainly specialty digital formularies, right? Uh, on different health systems, Trina Histon uh, with Kaiser Permanente, for instance. Um, but the app store here for Google uh, is uh, not really apps, but actions, they call it, where you have, you don't install an app, you just ask what you, you just say what you want and you get it. It's, it's very cool. Um, chat therapy, as we alluded to earlier, this, is, this has been around for uh, over, for decades. I remember growing up uh, in the 80s <laughs> and we had uh, Eliza, the chatbot, uh, provide some sort of Rogerian style therapy back to you. They would just kind of twist your words around and, say, and to make it look like it's listening. And uh, this one, this particular chatbot from uh, uh, Michael Rials and, his, Rials and his team at X2 um, actually was deployed for um, refugees five years ago. Um, and they're continuing to refine. I mean, what's interesting about these chatbots potentially could learn, but also if you, it, it's just like any sort of web page, any sort of book, or, um, or, you know, you just keep on creating and refining the chatbots to help with, um, you know, service gaps. Virtual reality also has been around for decades and it's only been, I'd say the past five-ish years where it's become significantly more affordable. Back in my day, we had a lot of different uh, uh, VR equipment that was expensive, thousands and thousands of dollars uh, and you required big rooms. But 
now you can get a, a, a Google Cardboard for 10 bucks, right? And see some VR on YouTube, uh, relaxation videos on YouTube. And there have been there has been research in this uh, area. Some uh, some hospitals are using this too, like Cedar Sinai. Uh, there's uh, Brendan Spiegel who uh, has been pioneering VR for pain through relaxation. But um, you know, just think of any sort of um, environmental uh, triggers or uh, situational triggers that you see in specific phobias. Specific phobias means fears, fears of like snakes or fears of um, closed spaces, fears of public speaking, like what I'm doing right now. Um, and then so, uh, social anxiety, alcohol use, where maybe you're triggered by um, alcohol, uh, exposure to alcohol or uh, ex exposure in a bar. PTSD, you're triggered by bad memories from the past, a bad, really, really um, life-changing experiences from the past. So we see this with VR exposure therapy. You know, you can combine a VR headset, a biofeedback sensor, a couple hundred bucks, right? And uh, potentially use these to deliver um, life-changing therapies and sessions to um, uh, to your patient. Uh, here, the therapist is controlling the number of people and, <laughs> in this enclosed space, a subway tube. Uh, for, and this, uh, now they're named as Amelia Virtual Care. Um, but um, it's it's incredible, and I believe that uh, folks are finding ways to combine this with psychedelic medications. Um, and very briefly, psychedelics long uh, outlawed, right? There's been an explosion of um, companies and researchers who are looking at psychedelic drugs. Why is that important? Psychedelics could potentially work significantly faster. Um, people describe opening their minds within days <laughs> and being open to new experiences. So it really shortens the time for traditional um, exposure therapies or psychological therapies from months and years to just, you know, potentially days and weeks. Um, so that's. VR and a touch on psychedelics. Um, we are also seeing technologies potentially uh, being helpful for persons on the aut with autism spectrum uh, disorders. This particular one is from one of my uh, colleagues and friends, uh, Arsha Vahabzadeh at Brain Power, where it's coaching um, uh, persons uh, to make eye contact, to recognize emotions. Um, sort of the social cues that we all take for granted um, and can potentially help bring uh, much more accessible treatments to persons with autism spectrum disorder. What kind of business model are these guys using? Well, it, seems, it looks like they're addressing the education market where they're seeing um, a lot of uh, need in the education and counseling space. Um, this one is not widely used. This is just a, a sort of a visionary statement, but we're seeing deep fakes, right? We're, um, anyone, if anyone, I, I wish I could see your hands if you could raise, <laughs> but if anyone here is a Star Wars fan, we've seen Mark Hamill uh, and Luke Skywalker show up as a young uh, Jedi again, um, thanks to, to video replacement technologies. We're seeing this also uh, on Star Trek Picard with um, you know, Q and you know, this is going on where we're seeing digital replacements in both voice and video. So could you use this? Could you use voice and audio replacement video to help heal trauma, to help people deal with their fears of specific people or specific persons or uh, reduce the intensity of psychoses? Um, which has been studied, reducing auditory or visual hallucinations, this ghosts, right? Um, so that's so, uh, the sort of thing that we can see in mental health. We're also seeing how we can change our environment too. Smart cars can reduce the stress of having to drive your automobile. Um, smart cities can increase internet accessibility and, uh, and, and also take a pulse on the environment. Smart homes can change the colors. I have blue lights on in this room and you see the LED strip lights on the side, uh, potentially on my, on my uh, camera. Um, so there's a lot of uh, different ways we can change things 
for our mental health. Right. So it's very cool. Um, I know Elon Musk has been in the news lately too. This uh, Elon has not just bought Twitter, but he <laughs> uh, recently, but five years ago, five ish years ago, he made headlines uh, for looking at um, uh, brain computer interfaces. Um, we don't use this widely in psychiatry, EEGs, encephalo and uh, e um, electroencephalography. Uh, and it's just because it's traditionally been clunky and not very um, specific um, for things. This particular one, I, I think I mixed up the photo. This is actually from a rival of Elon Musk's. This is from Facebook. And Facebook was also looking at uh, these brain computer interfaces. We've seen this too. They're also looking at VR. So, um, you know, potentially you could use this for biofeedback. Um, we're not seeing this in wide use, but um, but this I think would have uh, more utility for folks with uh, sort of communication issues uh, and communication disorders. And just as a joke, I just included this EEG based toys uh, have been on the market too. Um, this was twenty nine dollars a couple of years ago, but now it's a hundred bucks on Amazon. I just checked uh, checked yesterday, so. Um, you know, I don't know if it's getting any cheaper or more expensive necessarily, but there you go, EEG based toys, and they claim to help with concentration. So we have about 20 um, ish minutes left. I wanted to uh, spend some time to talk about how to make this a reality. And again, you're going to hear from uh, Christy Vo later. You're going to also hear from uh, Ed Kaftarian later um, about uh, more of their vision about mental health as well. But there's so many different factors at play. This is a uh, diagram from uh, evidence-based mental health about how to develop apps. It is complex, right? Um, and just as you have experienced yourself when you've deployed technology in your health systems and your clinics, um, it takes iterations. It's not gonna be perfect from the get-go, um, but uh, we're seeing growing sophistication this growing field of digital psychiatry, if you had to read one paper, if you had to read one paper about the future, I would read this paper. This is from John Torres, again, a friend, colleague at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. So John Torres uh, released this in World Psychiatry. He breaks it down on uh, all the different technologies from one to five. And he looks at psychological therapies smartphone data, active and passive, um, social media. We talked about that a lot, social media too, um, and virtual reality and chatbots. In general, he, uh, so you can read these for specific um, potential needs and you notice the fourth and fifth column, some of the issues that we need to work through. The general three themes I got from his paper are one, we need more research, we need more validation, we need more studies. Two, we need to get things to work together more. The, we need the data to work together more, interoperability. Uh, we need the industry and the academics uh, uh, par to, to partner more. Um, and then three, we also need to look at um, the ethics, privacy. Um, what kind of data is being mined uh, from these media companies? Um, CVS made some, there was a news headline recently about CVS health. Are they HIPAA protected? Because they're dealing with medical issues if you call their customer support line or, or is it CVS the drugstore that we're talking about? So, uh, you know, these are things that we just need to work through and, and uh, think about more. I've included a few other papers here. I won't go into the details specifically, but there's also a fantastic review of artificially intelligent AI chatbots essentially in digital mental health interventions. Notice the acronym DMH. We're gonna hear the digital mental health acronym a lot more later on. This particular paper was just released about half a year ago and it is by a AI company. Yes, uh, Happify. But I thought it was very thoughtful. It talks about that generally the chatbots uh, need more research too. Um, there just hasn't been the same level of sophistication in those research trials. And I think it's partly, partly because creating a chatbot seems easy, but 
it's not uh, the the it's not as easy as creating a website or a web page, right? Um, and then there are also some a lot of papers. If you search for digital therapeutics, this particular paper is from UCSF, and they talk about digital therapeutics, the pipeline. They break down all the different uh, um, products, indications, and availabilities for these digital therapeutics out there. Um, and I, I know I've thrown the term about, I've already explained a bit about DTX, but if anyone ever sort of asks you um, how to kind of clarify, the Digital Medicine Society or DIME Society, Digital Medicine Society put out this really good infographic showing the three different digitals, digital health, digital medicine, and digital therapeutics. And you notice that that circle gets a little smaller, just shrinks down as you go into the gray digital therapeutics. And that's because the sophistication of and the need for evidence grows as you go closer to the circle. I think of this similar to how you have nutrition, things that you put in your mouth. You've got your usual diet and diet and food uh, in that first gray table, uh, first gray box. Nutritional supplements, vitamins and herbs and supplements, a uh, little bit more regulation. And then you've got a lot of regulation with oral pharmaceuticals. So too, you can see this happening with digital health, digital health, digital medicine, and digital therapeutics. For digital mental health, you're gonna, if you are searching, and I, I bring out these terms, just in case you wanted to search for it yourself in uh, PubMed uh, or other uh, Google Scholar. There's um, digital, D, the, that, that row, that orange row in the middle, you see DMH repeated multiple times, digital mental health interventions, digital mental health treatments, and digital mental health itself. And, and you'll hear also M health thrown around for an earlier term. Um, so I just bring this up in case you wanted to do the research and look through this yourself um, about, about the different apps that are out there. You know, we didn't really talk about too much about the barriers. I know we're going to, you're gonna hear about this time and time again throughout this conference. Um, but, you know, particularly for digital therapeutics, I alluded to how there's really not an established infrastructure. Um, it's really up to the health systems to figure out how to deploy these apps or even get clinicians to recommend them. Um, there's also a lot of barriers like digital literacy, technology affordability and access, um, payment issues, what diagnoses are served. Are we, are we just uh, addressing the worried, worried, worried well, or are we looking at severe mental illness? severe mental illness where you're needing a lot more assistance. And then interoperability, interoperability and data sharing. That's an issue amongst these apps. Um, I'm, you know, when we, when I, um, I have a team at UCSF who's been, uh, and a lot of um, uh, volunteer researchers uh, and volunteer students who are analyzing te these technologies, there's a good chunk of them that are fully contained solutions where all you do is just do send a referral or a code. And then the, and it's as if you're referring to a completely different health system. So the data sharing isn't, you know, needs to be more robust. And then privacy and security are issues. Now, um, I know it depends on the EMR that you're using too, the electronic medical record system. Um, and some of these do have uh, great, app ecosystems, uh, you know, decent app ecosystems. Epic, for instance, has App Orchard, um, and, but it still takes more work, right, to integrate things into your health system. It's not plug and play. Back to digital literacy, there's so many different categories. Jay Ostrowski, uh, um, I don't know if he's still there, <laughs> if you're, I think Jay's still around, but he spoke yesterday about the need to train um, uh, your clinicians to train your partners about how to use these uh, programs uh, and apps. It's not just a matter of plopping things in. I see this time and time again with my teammates, um, little things crop up, right? Um, I only myself got an iPhone two years ago and I, I, couldn't, uh, <laughs> I couldn't make sense of the uh, lack of the home button. I'm so used to a home button. Um, I'm kind of dating myself. But anyways, how to get internet, how to install apps, launch apps. Um, these are all things that, you know, we can teach. And it's, and it's no different from in-person care where 
you may be having to navigate transportation and traffic to get to uh, healthcare. Um, about, uh, well, last decade, my uh, colleagues and I, John Torres again and Peter Yellies, we pi uh, authored a paper uh, at UC Davis and Harvard about the different aspects, pros and cons of mental health apps. This eventually transformed into something called the APA app evaluation model, um, where these have all the criteria you need to evaluate apps. And we've published on this, we've educated people, thanks to Nate Tatro, uh, who's now at Mental Health America, and uh, Michelle Durst, who is now at the Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, uh, just to help people wrap their heads around what makes a good app. Um, so you can download this for free. We even have uh, examples uh, in a publication called App Advisor. You can also see and choose apps from other databases. John Torres launched this. And it's called mindapps.org, M-I-N-D apps, A-P-P-S.org, uh, where he and his team essentially scoured these apps for features and uses and evidence. Um, and a colleague also, Stephen Schuler at UC Irvine, put together CyberGuide with his team, where they have their own evaluation model. Um, uh, I think the thing to watch out for these evaluations are that it's just a review, a snapshot in time. And it's not unlike, say, Joint Commission or CARF, where they do these audits or um, accreditations every so often. Um, so too, you're going to see this with these apps and platforms. Um, but uh, we also are seeing different criteria come up. Dr. Sobowal, um, Kunmi Sobowal uh, put together these DEI criteria, um, things like uh, things that, that we should keep in mind for uh, apps, such as language. Is it culturally specific? Does it incorporate uh, persons with disabilities? Um, and are there visual representations of different types of people uh, from different ethnicities, religion, minorities, gender expression. It's actually very good, uh, all the things that they've, they've been very thoughtful about uh, to make it more, uh, to make it address all Americans or all, all different, uh, whatever population you're targeting. Um, a team of mind at UCSF uh, led by Andy Arbach and Ben um, and Tiffany, uh, we've been looking at curated digital health tools. We've been working with health systems, uh, some major health systems around the nation, um, and uh, in putting together a new effort to curate EMR integrated apps, as well as vendors as well. Uh, one of the most common pain points, you probably have faced this yourself, um, you know, and I, I wish I could ask for a show of hands, but a it, the, the chief, I, I heard the statistic, chief medical informatics officers or chief health informatics officers receive a vendor solicitation on average about every 18 minutes in their email. <laughs> so I heard the statistic somewhere in one of the conferences, you probably get a lot of solicitations as well. Um, this is supposed to be uh, uh, serving as a, a common application and you can uh, uh, learn more about it at uh, UCSF or advicehealth.org. Um, and it helps because we have, there's just so many different things that play, uh, to, that take into a, uh, play here um, when it comes to di these digital therapeutics and these apps. This particular one's from the FDA. The FDA is thinking about all the different things that can go into a digital therapeutic from one to four. Um, and four, if you look at point four, that's the key for uh, if it is for a medical purpose to inform, drive, diagnose, or treat, they need to know. And, uh, and so there needs to be more rigor around it. So we talked a lot about these different terminologies. Um, I'm noticing that it's uh, about uh, 6.37 on my end, 9.37 probably your end. So I'm gonna skim through the next few slides, um, but you're welcome to reach out to me at Stephen Chan MD. Uh, or on Twitter or .com, and I can help send the rest of these to you. We talked about DMH we're, uh, on the slide. 
if you also, I also wanted to point out a really cool report called Digital Health Trends 2021. Here, they show all the different ways an app or a platform can get reimbursed from direct consumer, point one, to um, device and drug reimbursements, point two and three, and value-based care models, point four. Um, and they show all the different apps that are out there. Point three here shows that the blue, um, most of the apps and programs are now psychiatry oriented, um, which is great for me. I, I, I'm noticing that 10 years ago, there wasn't a lot of much on the market. So it's great that we have more choices for our better, uh, patients and uh, patients that we serve. Point three here shows there's been a lot of different apps available. Um, and a lot of them uh, are sticking around. There's less attrition. That's point three here, uh, where that line going down is the attrition per year. Um, they also have very nice diagrams, again, on IQVIA site, their report um, by Murray Aiken and Deanna Nass. This one shows uh, a lot of the different um, digital therapeutics out there and the level of evidence. And the good news is that there's more and more evidence um, uh, in that can be used uh, to support the use of these apps. So many apps, so many digital therapies out there. Um, this one is from Stephen Hayes uh, at What If Ventures, cataloging all the different mental health startups out there. What If Ventures. Um, and we are finding that we need more and more work uh, around this because the FDA's current approach, this top bar, number two, that's a really long review period, can take months to years, right, uh, for their usual approach. Point four is what they're trying to shorten it to, but they're not, they're not there yet. That's a new program called PreCert, and PreCert will pre-certify um, some organizations and their apps if they are say, following good manufacturing practices uh, style uh, sort of criteria. So the FDA is still working on trying to get more innovations through. Um, and then finally, uh, the AMA released this report um, just, I think, within the past half year on how to integrate psychiatry, behavioral health, psychology into the patient journey from left to right, patient intake to treatment, and all the different tools that are out there. Um, that are needed to support the, uh, psych, uh, the behavioral health <laughs> integration journey. Um, there are some other key papers, the Banbury Forum Consensus Statement. Essentially, this paper says um, psychology uh, and psychiatry, psychology particularly, needs to have more representation. Psychologists at the, in many places are not able to prescribe treatments. Why is that? Um, it's not quite clear. So there should be a mechanism to include other providers, um, they argue. There are papers about digital health tools. Um, and then finally, I'm going to leave with this last few slides. APA, uh, we have white papers out there for hybrid care, where we talk about combining digital technologies in with in-person and remote visits. And we have some events coming up, the APA Mental Health Innovation Exchange, which I'm chairing in uh, September uh, or August, I'm sorry, uh, as well as these other excellent ones. The one on the bottom left is free, Going Digital at, by Solome Tibebu, more on the VC side, um, but you should sign up for that. That's free to attend, you can donate. So that's it in a nutshell. Hope you enjoyed it and hope this is helpful. I, I do appreciate any feedback um, and I'll, Turn it over to Jay, who might be there. Jay, there you are. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you, um, Dr. Chan. I want to. We have a couple of minutes left. I want to ask if there are any questions um, in our few minutes. If anybody had any burning questions, they want to ask Dr. Chan. We have a couple of microphones out here. If you'd like to step up and give it a try. Yeah, thank you for a great presentation. I was just uh, sort of reviewing in my own head concerns about using essentially bots. AI and so forth to respond to human beings and need, depression, anxiety. I think you mentioned, um, is it refugees or somebody? Syrian refugees, yeah. Syrian refugees yeah. and so on. It just, it sort of hits me as a, there's a disconnect there when we 
are using automatic language to respond to people that are human beings in need. Um, I just find that troubling. But that's yeah. a small, small comment. Uh, I, I certainly appreciate all of the advances in digital, but that, that piece of the uh, deletion of the human connection is, is not, I don't think that's a good, a good thing. So just a comment. Yeah. Dr. Shan. No, that's an excellent point. Um, and I think that's why we need to have, make sure that these are ethically there. We build in ethics, uh, ethical competency, cultural competency. So we're not leaving people, persons with limited English proficiency hanging, say. Um, and we also need to ensure that um, these are tested uh, properly and that we're not using these for um, high acuity, certainly not high acuity cases. Um, but, uh, you know, given the provider shortage, for some people, it's either um, some support or no support uh, or no care. Um, so that's the kind of the balance that we have to think about. I guess the question is, is, is that really care? Yeah, I, well, I think great question. Go ahead, Dr. Chen. Yeah. Um, when I was going through training, we would put together handouts, um, like printouts. Uh, and we'd also put together, we would also recommend books. So chatbots are not humans. In fact, that some groups specifically say that this is not a human, right? And if you try them out, um, they don't have an open-ended uh, like question answer sort of process. Uh, you, you only have a limited items to choose from. So I, sometimes I, in my head, I view them as sort of sophisticated books where you know, it, it can give you specific um, content at specific times, but certainly it's not a replacement for uh, a human. More, more like a guide to helping you think a certain direction, Dr. Chan? Depending on how you design it, yes. Okay. I think some of the discomfort, because I've had some of that along the way as well, that discomfort of, as a clinician, um, having, before you experience it is, you know, this just feels so like disconnect like that can't work um and the other part is well what would it miss along the way um or could it do harm leading them the wrong direction like go drink alcohol to, re to relax um and and that's the fear when i'm you know people ask me what apps to use is and i'll, I'll often refer to the va's apps because i know they've done the homework on it um but there's some that are that are um, venture capital funded, and we know that's more for profit than for maybe sometimes not um, best practices. So, yeah. um, Dr. Chan, before we wrap up, any final comments before we wrap up? Your voice is needed. This is the kind of thing that, you know, you don't want to necessarily leave to the venture capital people. You don't want to necessarily leave to um, big tech firms. So um, I, I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and there's no silver bullet. Um, but it's it's thrilling. I hope you. Um, uh, I would love to hear your feedback and your thoughts on on what the future of mental health is going to look like. Well, thank you all for uh, joining us, and thank you, Dr. Chan, for your great presentation. Good to meet you. Take care. <laughs>